Good evening. It is with great pleasure that I have to introduce to you Dr. Helen Caldicott. Unfortunately, I had to shoot the video on a phone because of some technical difficulties. So please excuse the lower quality. However, you will find that the passion and content is there. Dr. Helen Caldicott is a real hero of the planet. I'm sure you'll enjoy this. Dr. Caldicott, I apologize for the technical problems and I apologize most of all for not doing justice to your interview because I don't think I have the ability to do the uh, introduction that you deserve. But welcome, uh, Dr. Caldicott. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jay. So I, what I want to do with this Truth Seekers path is to explore people such as yourself who's been providing uh, access to an awakening. Uh, people are woken up by you. Your passion, your content, your delivery, it all speaks to me. It resonates. And I'm sure others feel the same. Many others will feel the same. Um, I'd like to go into some of your past. I'd like to know when you woke up. I have a hint it might have been On the Beach, a novel that was written, but that may not be the only case. No, that, that is correct. I read it in my adolescence. And uh, I got such a fright because I lived in Melbourne. And at the end of the book, of course, there was a nuclear war caused by accident in the Northern Hemisphere, which could happen tonight. And the radiation cloud gradually came down to Melbourne, so far south, and uh, everyone died. And that was the end of the human race. And because I lived in Melbourne, it just marred my soul, branded my soul. Then I went to medical school when I was 17 and learned about genetics and radiation from a wonderful lecturer called Peter Martin. And at that time, Russia and America were testing bombs in the atmosphere like there was no tomorrow. And I couldn't understand what these men were doing. You know, a young female med medical student, very idealistic. And so being a curious disposition, I've always read everything I've come across about nuclear weapons, nuclear power, the whole thing. And because I've got a brain that stores that, that excuse me, that sort of information, so I understand most, most of it. Sorry, I'm hiccuping. <laughs> That's okay. That's fantastic. Yeah, your delivery and your content are unparalleled uh, because it speaks to people with, um, without that background that you have, but we know we can feel something's wrong. We know it's not making sense from the official uh, stories. So when you talked about how serious these issues are with Fukushima, nuclear disaster, nuclear power, any f actually any fission and any, nu any, any military action is basically what you're against. Absolutely. I'm against killing. I'm a physician. I took the Hippocratic Oath. I've spent my whole life trying to check save people's lives and nature as well. So I, <laughs> the, the thing is that the military industrial complex in America has totally taken over the American economy and indeed the economy of the world. And they're exporting weapons to friend and foe like everybody. And, and killing is the new modus operandi. Uh, and it just, I don't know what to do next. I don't, I mean, and it, I have to say it's all men. Yeah. So uh, if we continue doing this, I mean, the world's laced with nuclear weapons ready to explode and, and that'll be the end. I mean, Russia and America own 94% of all the nuclear weapons in the world, of which there are about 16,000. Um, and if only a, a thousand bombs were used on a hundred cities, which is what the targeting is, except it's small, um, that will create nuclear winter and a, a short ice age by covering the atmosphere with a very, very thick cloud blocking out the sun, and that will be the end of most life on Earth. And, you know, these idiot politicians, I don't think they really understand it or know it, and I think the reason is because the media have been drawing our attention to other things so they can sell their so-called products. Um, and we're in a state of denial or manic denial, Yes, so that most politicians in, are scientifically and medically illiterate and that holds true for the populations and if they don't understand, it's not very difficult to explain these concepts and the dangers of nuclear power, nuclear war and global warming to people because as a physician I'm able to translate 
medical language into lay language so people understand their diagnosis and treatment, etc. So that's what I do. Um, and you do it very well. Could you walk me, I'm, I'm just personally curious, and I'm not sure if this exists anywhere, and I think other people who are aware that there's something wrong and aware they have some capacity but unsure what to do, hearing you say I'm, I'm unsure what to do is probably comforting in some way because a lot of us feel the same, uh, Dr. Helen. So if if we go back to how how this, so you had you had this, you were quite young when you went into medical school, school and then you your wake yeah. your wake seventeen, 17 yeah. and and your wake up was just prior to that, yeah. just prior, and um, so you've been full bore the whole time. Well, I mean, I <laughs> I went to Harvard and was an instructor in pediatrics there. Um, and I learned how to treat children with cystic fibrosis, and I set up the first CF clinic in Australia in Adelaide, which now has the best results in Australia, longevity. Um, and I, you know, I worked as, for many years as a pediatrician, and I left Harvard in 1980 to work full-time to prevent nuclear war because I'd just been to Russia and met with a lot of very high-ranking Russians with ex-CIA officials and the like, and I found out that America was going to deploy cruise missiles, which are unverifiable because you can hide them un under haystacks, etc., and and Pershing two missiles that hit Moscow in three minutes. And I thought, you know, why am I treating individual patients when all the world's children are at risk? So I I left. And I felt terrible about it because I had a wonderful job, the best in the world that I could have, really. And I think I would have been promoted, but I just felt impelled to try and educate people about the medical effects of nuclear war. And I founded then Physicians for Social Responsibility and recruited 23,000 physicians, and we had 123 chapters in America. And we really led the movement against nuclear weapons and nuclear war such that over five years, for most Americans thinking it was better to be dead than red, 80% um, opposed that concept and were, were very, very worried about nuclear war. And that happened in five years. From 1978 uh, to 83. Well, Dr. Helen, uh, I'd like to really just spend a one one half minute just to thank you so much for your contribution. You've given up a lot of your professional and personal life, and it wasn't to enrich yourself. I mean, obviously you had pursuits, but you've given up a lot. And, well, I don't uh, have much money to live on now in my old age. Mm. <laughs> um, so I never thought about money. I just, and as a doctor, I got paid, you know, but I, uh, I'm a, I suppose if I put my intelligence to making lots of money, I could have, but it never interested me in the slightest. So that's how it's gone. Well, you've touched probably millions of people. You had 23,000 doctors just on one of your many um, organizations that you were involved with and founded. Uh, I don't know what to say. I'm a little bit dumb, dumbstruck by the um, uh, amount of capacity that you've got and what you've put forward. I think it's really just about honoring you and anyone who can achieve one tenth of what you've done really deserves to be honored by the whole world. So we need That's to honor our, our, our people who get active and try to make this a better place and save, as you said, not only the people, but biology, everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And people can easily look at some of your videos, just Google search, YouTube search, look at the top ranked uh, Helen Caldicott. Uh, videos and you'll see the content rich delivery with passion that you have so we don't need to go through all of that now but it's very interesting to touch these cornerstone events that uh, have helped you understand uh, what path to go on and um, have you any in have you had moments where you felt that it's really been worth it that you've made an impact I mean you've done so much and you, you I did in the 1980s when the Cold War came to an end and I had met with Reagan in the White House and spent an hour and a quarter with him trying to educate him about all concepts of nuclear war. And then he started working with Gorbachev and it was wonderful. But 
since that time, you know, we thought, thank God, they'll get rid of the nuclear weapons, and they didn't, in fact. And America's about to replace every single missile ship, aeroplane, nuclear weapon um, with new ones over the next 30 years, spending uh, $1.7 trillion, I think. Um, it's madness. And I, I just see the world going to hell in a handbasket, and I, I'm nearly 80, uh, and I, I don't often say this in public, and maybe I shouldn't say it, but as a physician looking at all the data and information and what's happening, I, I think our prognosis is, is very grim, Tate. Yeah. Well, Dr. Caldecott, that brings up another subject that I can understand. Um, I, I don't understand uh, all of the stuff that you talk about, but the way you say it makes it resonate, and I do feel I have a grasp for a while. One thing about these nuclear reactors is they require so much energy and people and constant attention, constant maintenance. And without that maintenance, things go um, uh, haywire and we get, um, we, we get uh, a, a, another Fukushima. And these Fukushimas could be extended. I mean, how many countries ha can manage nuclear facilities and how long do they have to manage them before... It, 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 it's, it go, it la the dangers last long after the plant's life. Well, the problem with nuclear reactors is not just Fukushima. Um, it's nuclear waste. And they're piling thousands of tons of this stuff up, which has to be isolated from the ecosphere for a million years, which is a physical impossibility yeah. by our little brains. Uh, and this material will relocate into water supplies and then bioconcentrate in the food chains. But you can't see, taste or smell radioactive elements in the food. And then it takes up to from 5 to 50 or 80 years to develop a cancer from eating radioactive elements in the food. Uh, and, and it also will affect reproduction and cause genetic abnormalities, of which there are 2,600 now described or thereabouts, and congenital deformities, and, and, the, and there are homes full of children around Chernobyl with the grossest congenital deformities. Um, and so that over time, I did write my first book called Nuclear Madness in 78, and I said there will, this will cause epidemics of cancer, leukemia, genetic disease, and congenital deformities for the rest of time, and of course it's not just in humans, it's animals and plants, because they have genes too, and the genes are mutated and changed biochemically by radiation. So, but, but yeah, the thing that occurred to me yesterday was if we have a nuclear war, of course, there are over 400 nuclear power plants in the world now, and they'll all melt down. And that hasn't been included in the concept or understanding of nuclear war. No, that's that's incredible. They'll all melt down. So we've got mm -hmm. we've got four hundred Fukushima's. Yeah. Wow. Four hundred Fukushima's. And that's after so the war. I, I haven't mm. ever really sort of. I, I, I better I better put notices on Facebook about that and Twitter because it. I just it occurred to me yesterday. My God. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, where, where are the different rays of light that you see? And, um, I mean, obviously, what, what would you suggest to someone who knows half of what you know and would like to do something? Um, I would suggest that maybe they watch If You Love This Planet and uh, read Crisis Without End and look at some of my videos. You could go to my website, helencaldicott.com, and there you'll find the books I've written. It's imperative that you become well-informed before you get involved. If you read all this stuff, you're going to get pretty depressed, which is normal. But as you go through these feelings, suddenly you'll know what you have to do. And you can become a leader. I mean, look at your prime minister. You're in New Zealand, aren't you? Yes, that's right. Your prime minister is a magnificent woman. Um, and she, she I, I helped to, to um, affect the movement in New Zealand uh, to become nuclear free. Um, I spent, and my then husband spent a couple of weeks talking in towns and cities all across New Zealand, and the New Zealanders rose up and said we won't have nuclear weapons and ships. But um, 
you need to become well educated and then just wait and you'll know what you have to do you could become a great leader any of you or maybe you're not of leadership material but you'll work out what it is we need a major major revolution we need a major uprising if we're to save the only life in the universe um, I think the students who come from that high school in Florida where it was they were gunned down they're good but it, we're an excellent actually but we're only talking about guns we're not talking about the end of my flowers out there and my pussycat and everything everything yeah and and I think people need to take that on I saw a woman the other day in a, a framing shop and she was a little old woman and and we and it was very hot that day and I said, you know, this is global warming. And she said, oh, I try not to think about that. Well, there you go. And I think that's what the Germans did under Hitler. Well, it won't be so bad, and if I obey the law, and things will get better. And I think we're doing that today in a different context. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The wake up begins from within, and what to do depends on who you are and your skills. Well, and also, what are the churches doing? I mean, if there's a God, I don't think there is a God, but anyway, what responsibility do they have to the Creator to save life on Earth? But yeah. What are they talking about? Yeah. Celibacy and oh, God. Yeah. yeah. It, it, must be, it must be frustrating to see things go up and, and get some hope there with uh, Ronald Reagan and, and Gorbachev. What a fantastic story. And you met with Reagan before that. What a, how was he like in person? Was he registering anything you said? He was a nice old man. That I, and I estimated he had an IQ of about 100, okay. which is just average, taking in Down syndromes and, you know, everyone. Um, he, he knew virtually nothing about technology and the concepts and plans for nuclear war. I'd just written my book, Missile Envy, and I just had facts and figures coming out of me. So we would talk, and he would make a statement which was incorrect. So I'd correct him, and he got quite flustered and, and fla flushed. And I ended up holding his hand for sort of half of the t uh, hour and a quarter, establishing really a doctor-patient relationship. And I thought I had absolutely no impact. But after I left, he started to say nuclear war must never be fought and can never be won. And that's when he started working with Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. Because they had seen our film, um, or, or they had our doctors on television in Moscow, and Gorbachev understood immediately what it meant. And Reagan got to understand, and, and you know, 80% of the American people supported an end to the nuclear arms race. So it all happened like that. So it was it was good. It was good. But now, I I don't know, I want on my tombstone she tried, that's all. I would, I would that's second that. That's where I hear that Bill tombstone. But it's up to us. We yeah. have to take on the responsibility. And I don't think many of us understand what a democracy really means. It means that the people we elect are our representatives and we are their leaders. And so therefore, if we don't participate and educate them all the time, they then get into the hands of the corporations and the weapons makers. And they become prostitutes to the corporations. But really, that's our fault. Yeah. Get active. It's, it depends if you love your children. How much do you love your children and grandchildren? And yeah. you want them to have a, a safe, secure future. That's yeah. what it's about. Yeah. Or as I said at the end of my le lecture, if you love this planet. Yes. Thank you for your efforts, uh, Dr. Caldecott. Yes. I, I'm really glad to have this time with you. I know you're busy, and I'm sorry for the technical issues, but I think the content no, here is coming out. And, um, yes. I don't know what else to say. If you need anything at all, uh, let me know. Maybe there's something that comes up. And uh, I'm always always glad to have you on. If there's something I can promote for you or, or if, if you have something to say, well, you've got your own oh, well, sounding I've got a words. I've book out at the moment called Sleepwalking to Armageddon, so you could promote that. Very appropriate. Um, yeah. I, will, I will be happy to uh, 
pay for a signed copy and if I'm ever in the area I'll come to your book signing. Will, will you have a book signing? Are you going on tour for, for this? Uh, I'm speaking at the Bendigo Writers Festival and the Brisbane Writers Festival, but that's all. But I'm sure you could get the book in New Zealand. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. I'll get it, I'll read it, and then we'll have a, I'll, I'll give a review online and uh, send you a link. Thank you, Tate. Okay, you're welcome, Dr. Helen Count Caldecott. Thank you very much. Hero of humanity. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.